Hello, chess friends. This is International Master Valera Wolf, and um, I'd like to, sort of, to, to make you forgive me for being a few minutes late today. It's just a couple minutes late. I'm having a birthday. It's crazy around here, so sorry to make you wait. In any case, um, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about how to get better in chess. Okay, how do we get better in chess? Okay, isn't that the topic that everybody is really asking himself and scratching their heads and trying to figure out, okay, what do I do that will help me to dominate my opponents and just make me a stronger, a tougher, and a bigger player than my opponents? And the truth is yes. So what we're going to talking about, what we're going to talk about today, are a few very important things. So I'd like to outline so that you guys know what we're going to discuss. So we're going to talk about how using forcing moves is important like the forcing moves are the most powerful moves in chess we're going to be talking about strategic skill set and how to acquire them we're going to be talking about how masters balance the positional with the tactical chess and more importantly we're going to be talking about essentially aggressive and defensive play as the two key skill sets that you have to improve to get better at chess and yes Please bear with me. It's my birthday again. <laughs> so I want to say to anybody who's actually thinking, okay, Valerie, are you are you up for that? This is a tough, tough task. I'll try my best. I don't guarantee anything, but I hope you guys like it. And I hope you're I was I'm able to provide you with some good, consistent advice as to what you can what you can improve and uh, how to work in your how to work on your chess. So, uh, okay, so what we're going to do is let's start. I mean, what I would li really like to do is I would actually like to start with um, a game of mine, as a matter of fact. Yes, because you see, the best way for me to bring up the idea on how to get better is if we talk about what I was able to do better and make stronger to, to, to get my game more. I mean, it, it almost feels like it was yesterday, although some chess masters say it was like it's some time ago, and it was some time ago. Basically, I remembered the exact elements that helped me to make the breakthrough. And, okay, so what is a breakthrough in chess? Now, as an improving player, everyone wants to know what should be my best goal. Keep in mind that to make a breakthrough, you need to know the key points and the key point is first making 1300 then going for 1500 then going for 1700 1900 and we always have this 200 points difference that that requires an important break when I was 1300 it was very easy all I needed to do was to basically make sure I know how to protect my pieces and that was enough usually my opponents were giving them before me so that was cool when I got to the 1500 well that was actually a pretty good stage because I needed to make sure that I'm able to convert my advantage to actually figure out, you know, good positional features like what is a weakness, how do I get in my pieces better. That was important and it helped a lot. Okay, so then then when I got to 1700, well, that was a stage where I needed a little bit more of a push and that is what I'm going to be talking to you right now. So bear with me because we're going to see some really old games of mine. Now, I hope you don't feel angry if you're expecting Gary Kasparov or Bobby Fischer. We'll get to those games, and I don't try to make any comparison. But we'll start with a couple of my own games so I can show you how I was able to master these different things in order to, well, get better, hopefully, <laughs> which I did. So give me a second. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to load one of my uh, most memorable games, so to speak. I was very young at the time. Okay, I was very young at the time, and I was still making a lot of these huge mistakes, like blundering and all over the place. Uh, I felt like I was around 1700, but not exactly. I didn't. I feel like I couldn't make that breakthrough yet, so I had to change certain things in order to make myself better. And that game kind of helped me to do that. It it it. So uh, I I'd like to show you. Let me get to open up now. This is a game. I hope that my opponent at that time will recognize it. It was a, it was my first international chess tournament, and there it is. I was playing against a Turkish player. He 
He was a very talented young player. He was actually played in year 2000. I was only nine year old at the time. I still didn't have any rating. Uh, and uh, it was a pretty, well, intimidating experience because I was playing at the European Individual Chess Championship for kids. Now, the thing about this championship is that uh, actually when you look at it, it's, it doesn't sound like it's anything too big, but all the best players of their countries go there. So, I mean, even if we're just talking about kids, so these are the best kids, the first and the second, at least that was when I was playing. So, uh, and I was playing against one of the best Turkish chess players. So basically I started with E4. I've always liked the open games. Then I did knight f3, pawn to d6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4. Now we'll go through the opening stage quickly because it really doesn't involve anything special. It's just opening theory. Black played the dragon variation. And what happened is after uh, bishop to the e3, black played bishop to g7. And I did bishop c4. For those of you who are not that familiar with the opening, let me just say that basically White's major goal is to support the center, then get to have this develop his development and his pieces around it. So he could eventually castle and start planning for an attack. And it kind of works in most cases. Of course, Black has his own possibilities. Later on, I was the one who took over this opening as Black, and I used it many times to do, to play, have some beautiful games. But back in the back in the time, I loved playing it uh, as White. So, Bishop d7, long side castles, and Rook c8. The whole idea is that because White dominates the center, it is considered that his own attack and launch versus the Black King is going to be a little faster and more flexible. Of course, Black relies on the quicker development of his pieces and the fact that he doesn't need that much, that many proprietary moves in order to begin his attack. In fact, instead of the pawns, he's immediately starting with pieces. In a way, I was prepared and I wasn't because when I played h4, I have seen some, ma I had seen some master games in which White sacrifices the h4 and the tags. But to be honest, I didn't see the move of h5. And the first time when that move came to me, I was like, oh man, this is, ah, I can't do g4 because he's going to win my pawn and I can't push h5 no more. He played it so quickly, so I knew he was prepared and I wasn't. And I was really, really frustrated. Well, as much as a 10 year old kid could be frustrated. I mean, the idea is I felt like I didn't know what to do. And that is one of the things that a lot of chess players get into. And that's why, do you know that why almost everybody wants to study openings? It's exactly that one stage where basically the opponent makes a move that you don't know about, or, you know, these players don't know about. And then you suddenly ask yourself the question, what do I do? I have no idea. I feel confused. I feel lost. And they start playing around and they lose. And what most chess players think is that the more theory you study, the better you will get by actually by the book. And the, the problem is it gets even more frustrating when you study all that theory and you want to try it, but then the opponent deviates with something that you don't expect or it's not in the book and you lose again. And you think that more openings will do it. And it's like, you know, basically you, you get lost in that, in that circle that just you keep feeding yourself with more and more and more theory that never translates in the game because basically the opponent doesn't follow it. He plays something else and you get confused and you get terrified out of the opening. So that is something I've had and experienced and I've actually found a way to overcome that. For anyone out there who's ever experienced a problem with his opening repertoire, I have one advice for you. Remember that success in the opening is not in knowing the opening in an in a absolutely detailed way. I mean, of course, there are certain ideas you want to know about the opening and the main move order, things like that for sure. But the key to, to really mastering an opening is to understand the strategic idea. Every opening has a strategic idea and the strategic idea is not influenced by the move order, by how your opponent deviates or does not deviate from the game. If you know it, you don't, make, you don't need to know the exact m opening moves, so you can follow it. You can logically find the moves. So I had no idea about the theory here, but what I knew is that in order to succeed with my play, I have to follow my strategic idea. And what my strategic idea was is to open the king. I didn't know what I was, go what I was going for, 
but I said, you know what? Whatever it is, it is. I'm going to open up. I'm going to sack the pawn, and maybe I will fail, but at least it will be better than if I just start playing passively and move around with my pieces. So that was my goal. Now, of course, what happens if black takes the pawn? He didn't take it, but what would go if he was going to take it? If he was going to take the pawn, I was going to go for h5. And in fact, it's not as bad as it may seem. Black will win two pawns, but the open lines that appear on the king side area are more than what I can expect to have for my attack. For instance, if bishop h6 comes, in case black tries anything like... Actually, I don't even know what he can try. Let's suppose something like e6 to prevent that knight from jumping. Then there could be a rook dg1. <clears throat> And then we're seeing how the uh, amount of pieces going on the king side are going to provide some brilliant combinations on that area. So I hope you find that very enjoyable. So this is what we can find. It's very easy. It's very effective and, uh, you know, a nice shot out there. So, yeah, actually, after the move of bishop h6, it is black who's got to resolve the problems. I'm not so sure about his best way to go. Even now, I've I, see this has been like 16 years eight, eight later after I played that uh, that game. I still don't know the theory of that opening, but I'm confident enough. If I have to play this, I can figure it out. You know, that is what Aaron Nimzovic used to say. One of the greatest players of the 20th century and a teacher also. He used to say, "Just do free yourselves of the slavery." of the book moves. Now, I am not, you know, paraphrasing. He said it exactly like that. Free yourselves from the slavery of the book moves. If you basically rely only on book moves, you don't understand the opening, and you never will. You have to rely on strategic ideas. See, that is what will help you to know the right plan and follow it up, no matter whether you know the moves, whether your opponent will confuse you, whether he will go away from the opening, or whatever. The structure dictates attack on the king's side. So that's all you have to know. The typical idea is g4 no matter what. So my opponent was, I guess, scared to take it. So he didn't do it. He played knight c4. And uh, yeah, actually I just took on c4. Black took back with the rook. And I captured on h5. So g takes h Knight takes h5. Now, because I want to make this lecture as interactive as possible, of course, I'm going to be asking you certain questions. And this is the first question we talk about. So, like, what do you feel white should do right now? <clears throat> this is a good question to think about. And it's a, I think it's a pretty important query because, obviously, it is quite critical to figure out the best approach, the best way to go. So I'd like to know what you guys have to say and uh, what should white do? So please share share your opinion on the chat, and I'd be glad to comment on that. So, by the way, while you're actually thinking about this, just let me let me tell you that right below this this lecture's webinar, I mean, like, just there is a link for a sixty percent discount. Yes, on twenty seven hour course for beginner play level. So anybody who wants to study chess and you're still trying to work your way around getting better take a look at it i think you can find it very interesting so just check it out it is possibly the best course for a bit for for that level that you can you can look at so in any way let's get back to the game let's get back to where everything is happening so what should white do now i'd like to hear your thoughts and your suggestions rook g1 Bishop H move ways, but plan wise, no idea. Nah, I don't. I don't think it works because the knight's gonna hang. I can't do that. We could try playing for an rook G1, but I think rook G1 will not cause any problems. Now, one of you asked, Valerie, so it's not good to study openings. I didn't say that. It is good to study openings, but it is good to study openings in the right way. So instead of studying opening variations and trying to memorize everything, which you will eventually forget. Try to learn the typical strategic ideas, which will serve you as a guideline, as a, a core that you can very easily not only remember the moves, but actually find your own moves depending on the circumstance or the order your opponent cho chooses to pick. So uh, basically what you would like to do is to play F4. I, that's what I did. Well, was there a better move than that? You know what? Yes. 
there was knight d2, there was king b1. But I felt like this pawn is going to have a tremendous value by moving on to the f5. And that's the way to go. When you're setting up your attack, there are two things that will actually make a difference. The first thing that's very important is going to be to uh, think about the possibility to get uh, more pieces out there. And then the other thing that you would like to do, which is also just as valuable, is going to be to try and, no, don't forget it, push the pawns. The, advancing the pawns will be to clear the path so that the remaining pieces that you have on the backside are genuinely going to reach down the opponents. So this is important. Okay, and uh, in fact, after uh, continuing with the f4 move, there is f5 coming up, and Karpov played knight de2. Yes, probably he did. I mean, I'm not saying that there is a better move, but this one is quite interesting. Now, it makes makes us ask the question, what if black takes the pawn? But on the other hand, you realize that taking the pawn will release the pad of the h-pawn, and in fact, after knight x h and rook dg1, there is going to be a little bit of a difficulty, if we can actually call it that way, a little bit of a difficulty for black to handle all the upcoming tactical threats like there, like that. There is knight f5 coming up. Uh, you know, obviously he can't take with the pawn due to queen h2. <clears throat> this is going to be very painful, checkmating threats. So yes, that's something I really wanted to do. I wanted to get that. Um, I don't remember exactly whether I saw knight takes f4, although knight takes f4 doesn't work, but it was a very smart move to go for an f5 with an idea of rig g1. So yes. Now, queen a5. And what do we do now? Okay, that's a good, very good question. Do we play with f5? Do we go about another move? What do we do? Anyone? <clears throat> Let's see what you guys have to say. Now, while you're thinking about this, but did you worry that f4 black would move bishop h6? No, because bishop h6 is not really an attack out there. So uh, can you talk about checkers after this game? I guess that's a joke, so not really. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you for, for asking. Any questions you can get, uh, just just answer, ask them here. Uh, you weren't scared of knight c4? Not really. There was always this chance to take there. Nine-year-old and 1700? No, in fact, I actually had a rating of 1985 when I was uh, when I was nine year old. <laughs> it may sound strange, but no, in fact, I was you know this is my rating, my official rating, but I never played at that strength, so I didn't tell you that. But not really, my official rating uh, when I was eight years old, like in 1999, was 1985. Then, of course, it fell a little bit in 1940, and still it. It was a national rating, and it didn't have uh, that, that, you know, obviously the ratings back then were a little, a little different, but I think that I was playing for around 1700, which is nowadays, you know, 1700 USCF. So anyway, uh, they, I got a question. Okay, one, let me answer that while you're thinking. So how does one study strategic plans for particular openings? Thank you. I need such questions. Thank you. For example, let's say I played a Sicilian. You said, how should I go about learning the plans? It's very simple. The three ways. First way is study videos. Okay. Now, there are some amazing videos, even within that package, this, this comprehensive uh, beginner course package. There are some incredibly good opening videos by masters who try to explain a lot about how what are the highlights of the openings. They give you the essential knowledge. So that's the first thing. If you don't focus on the moves, but on the uh, key ideas, that would help a lot. The second thing is study master games. A lot of masters know that this is the secret to being better at the opening. When you work on master games, you get a lot of different ideas as to uh, you know how master you know how masters treat the the opening beyond just the development. You know they how they how they go about it in the middle game, how they think about it in terms of uh, like key exchanges or key squares or key plans. So you're going to get a, a very strong feel for the opening by studying master games. And three. Yes, F number three, play. You have to play and get feedback. There's no other way for you to tweak it. If you get to play and you get a feedback, you can you know like just go over this again, uh, improve your repertoire with this opening. If you don't play it, if, if you don't lose many games, there is no way for you to really learn the strategic ideas and follow them correctly. These are the three, I'd say, golden rules of studying opening successfully. Now. Uh, uh, okay, um, now one of you said, okay, king b1. Yeah, king b1 is a good idea. Actually, many said knight e2, king b1, 
it was perfect out there. It's like we have this possibility, and then we have the, uh, uh, the, the defense on the A2. We have the knight coming and jumping out of the D5. It's a perfect idea. And there we go, King B1. Black played a rook after the C8. And then what we do is the move knight d5. I actually played it. Now that sounds like a scary, risky idea, exchanging the queens when there was an attack going on. But I realized that my opponent was really coming out to attack me. So you see, I thought, you know what? This is a good defense. So I want to talk to you about, like, start, we were starting with, like, point number five from the day. We're going to go in a sporadic order depending on the games we see. But how to defend. Do you know that the biggest problem of most beginner players is the risk management? They don't know when to risk or how to risk or when a line is risky. In fact, yeah, they hardly know much about why the mistakes they make happen. A lot of players, especially those who don't have a coach, they make a mistake and they look at the computer. The computer tells them, all right, this is what you have to do better. And then they get comfortable with themselves. Okay, I know now if I get to have a position like that, I'll, I'll, I'll know what move to do. But the truth is that you're probably not going to get the same position in the next thousand games. So, and even if you get it, you'll likely forget for that much time. So that's not the way. There's something else I want to tell you. To really understand why certain mistakes happen, you need to understand what risk in chess basically is and how we get in a situation that is risky. Now, first of all, what is a risk? Risk is when you take on a move or a decision or a sequence that basically leaves you with certain vulnerabilities. Now, some people choose purposefully to ignore those vulnerabilities in the position because they like the look of some move or some variation. Now, that is what I call as controlled risk. And of course, we have those situations in which we basically pick up on a move or decision without knowing it's risky. Now, both of these things happen. Now, the controlled risky moves amongst most beginners are the moves with which they sacrifice. They basically pick up on a move like, like a variation that is too, you know, shifty, it's challenging, but they just like it too much. And then, as I said before, other times they just don't see. My recommendation to you is the following. When it comes down to controlled risk, like sacrifices, for instance, be absolutely careful that you get a strong follow-up and continuation. That's not about it right now. I'm talking in general. However, when it's about a position in which you look at a variation, like say maybe we can talk about a move rook to the g1 right now. How do you know if this move is risky? Now that comes to something else. You see, when it comes down to a move that's not a sacrifice and that you don't even realize that it may be risky, the only way for you to, to understand the vulnerabilities in your position and to eventually feel that the move, there's something wrong with the move or the move could be potentially weak, is if you look at the opponent and his ability to create some challenges or, or actually threats or pressure versus your position. That sounds very simple. But if you ask most intermediate or beginner players whom you play with, and you I mean, you approach them and you ask, how often do you think about what your opponent can do in terms of threats? They'll likely say, eh, well, if you talk about consciously, co consciously, I mean, like, I don't know, I, I don't do that too much, but I guess subconsciously I'm able to see a lot of different moves. So I guess that should do it. And no, that doesn't cut it. You see, that is the problem. People rely on seeing the opponent's possibilities just along the way. And that doesn't quite work it. You see, if you are driving, for instance, and especially through a different through, through a different path, you know, just a diff, diff, difficult path, like a very, you know, you know, on a cliff, you can't just say, you know, I'm going to avoid the bad turn just by feeling it. Okay, it's it's the same sort of thing. You have to purposefully search, like look for it. And sometimes when you do it long enough, it becomes a habit. And then you learn to recognize the danger because you learn to constantly think about what your opponent wants to do. So my advice, in order for you guys to learn how to control the risk in your games and miss much less in terms of possibilities or threats or challenges by your opponent, is learn on every move to ask yourself the question, what is my opponent going to do?
And not just to think about, forget about news like King H8, Bishop F8, B6, A6, this type of stuff. It doesn't matter. Look at the forcing moves. Look at the threatening moves. Look at the moves that can give your opponent something tangible. Like Rook takes to C3, for instance. If the pawn takes on C3, there is Knight F6. And a lot of people would actually miss this type of move because they wouldn't be looking. They'd say, okay, maybe, you know, Queen D3. In fact, when you look at it, you see that it's pretty horrible. But people will miss it because they wouldn't even be thinking. Not be thinking about the C3, but thinking about what the opponent will do in general. It's a very simple and yet very common, very typical mistake. So this is how you get to avoid the risk. All right. So, uh, okay. In any case, um, just let's see if you got any other questions because, uh, all right. So then there's like a question. How does one start applying tactical ideas and over the board play? That is a very general question. I mean, tactics you can do by practicing on your own and doing tactics. There are many good websites to do so. And there are many good DVDs. Check out the, check out the 27 hours of 60% of discounted training for on, on the link below. It's amazing. It's like a complete course with all the necessary tactical and strategic teams that you need to know to improve your level. I think it's a very good one. You can check it out below the video. Um, and so, um, okay, one of you asked, um, let's say, sh should I make things complicated or simple during a chess game? I guess it depends. It depends on the position, so it's hard to say. And, okay, one more question to answer. Is studying tactics more important than opening or vice versa for beginners? Definitely tactics. You want to study the openings as much as what you want to study the end game. This means you want to study the key basics, like where do you develop your pieces in the first six or seven moves, like why, what you're looking for, that kind of stuff. But tactics is definitely something much more important, and uh, uh, that's how you'd like, to, you'd like to think about that. All right, so let's go on and show you what I did. Knight d5 was in one my, my way to get rid of the black queen. So after the exchange takes, black did king f8, and then I played rook g1. Since the position was more of an end game type, I thought that it may be a really good idea if I improve my rook. So my opponent did a pretty bad move. He thought that he was winning a pawn, but really he didn't. Exchange takes e6, and then I just knight, did knight e3. So that was basically it. Now, you know, another interesting thing about the game of chess that a lot of beginners don't understand is that it's actually all about outplaying the opponent. And the truth is, it is not. You see, you can't quite control the game where it's going. There's a lot of different possibilities, a lot of ways on how the game may go. But one of the ways to improve in chess, especially at that level, is if you get to optimize your chances. And to explain it in a very simple way, that's pretty much letting the opponent to blunder or make a mistake first. When that happens, you will it, it really improve your results. Because most chess players feel like, oh, I gotta attack him, I gotta break him, I gotta just feel the power of a queen sacrifice like Tal and Bobby Fischer and everybody who I've seen, I wanna do it this way. And you know what, it doesn't work. Because Tal, Fisher, Kasparov, anybody else, they have a different level, different on skill set. For your skill set, especially if you're at a beginner level, you would prefer to learn the more of a sneaky play. <laughs> you know, what we call as strengthening, improving, letting your opponent to jump first and weaken his position. And you just counter him with your better prepared and more powerful pieces. See what I did in this game. I actually did my active moves. I did my share of good F4 moves. But I never really risked it. I wanted to let my opponent to just push it first. And when he did, he already gave up his powerful bishop. And, okay, I moved my knight on g2 to protect the pawn. Obviously, I didn't want to tie my rook down to defense. And now he made another mistake. By bringing the pawn on d5, he made another mistake to push the position a little too early. So I did an exchange. Now we have an isolated pawn for him. So take stakes, a little c3 move. And I have to say that the position is not much better for me. It's rather equalish. But uh, okay, he just played bishop e6, rook f2, and a6. One thing I've I've appreciated most in chess is the ability for coordination. Now, when you get to connect your pieces to work together, everything works. Everything you thought was not going to work, it suddenly starts to work. And that's why I'm going to ask you here a very good question. 
what do we do as white in this moment? Why did king move Valerie? Well, if we go right back to the position of king b1, the reason why I did that was just to protect a2. I kind of felt the challenge that black was going to have against my knight and the a2 pawn, so I wanted to just take it out. But going back to it, we reached this position. So what does white do now? Knight e3. This is the move we do. We set the knight up. We got the F up. Now, one of you just commented. By the way, thank you for all the comments. I really like when you write to me just more than just one move or whatever. It's like when you give an expression or a question, and this is great. So, yeah, I ask myself many times what to do next, but most of the times there's few decisions, and I get lost there. What do you advise about that? I played with some Armenian person. You read me every time. Well, it doesn't matter what, he's, what country he's from. I can tell you that. But the most important thing, is uh, when it comes down to thinking for your opponent's threats and tactics, think for the forcing moves. Checks, captures, direct threats. What about him reading you every time? Well, that shows a bad direction, first of all, okay? Your direction, that's important for you to know, your direction was to create probably one or two type of, you know, we call it Cheap combos, that's actually the term we use in my country. <laughs> Cheap combos work nicely, but then the opponent is, as you said, reading you every time he's defending very well. So don't rely on that. This is not how how good player does a strategy. Good players rely on what I just did with my last move. Maybe my previous moves were not that great, but basically it's about building up a solid position where you know what your pieces are doing and you just go slowly. Is it called prophylaxis? No, it's called improvement. F5 was a pretty strong move right now. And the best of all things is that if Black Knight comes down to defend it, I had H5 on the line. If the Knight comes down to take this pawn, I was going to do F5. And that was actually pretty awesome because in case of G takes F5, Knight takes F5, then you could see the, the, real, the real deal here with the Knight and the Rook and everything. I'm losing a pawn, but look at the activity. The most important thing in the end game is the piece activities to have better development than your opponent. With that move, essentially if black exchanges, there will be rook takes f5 attacking the bolt, the bolt, the knight, and the pawn. The, otherwise, the bishop is coming in and the rook is ready. The knight is threatening to go to d4. The pawn really doesn't matter. The activity does. So black couldn't do this. And so what he played was bishop f5. Uh, and out of frustration, most likely, he just decided to put the bishop in. Takes takes, and then it was rook g5. Then black played rook h6, and just before I jump in and take that pawn, I made the move of rook f3, just to prevent any, compl any complications with knight g3. And that, I think, was the most critical move that I did. Is reading your opponent mind ca called prophyl uh, prophylaxis? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> it's like thinking about his intentions is what is called prophylaxis. Reading your opponent's mind is something that doesn't quite scientifically exist yet in the world, so I don't think you can do that. But you could certainly think about what he's intending to do right now, and yes, that's it. It's better done to telekinesis or whatever you call it. So Rook F3, Knight F6, and then what we do is we play with the move of Rook E3. That's the idea. I wanted to just get my pieces a little better. And then with the two rooks and the bishop, obviously there is too many things, too many pieces that dominate the opponent. He made a big blunder here. I think that he just did not realize uh, that I had these pieces so active. So he played knight 4 which basically ended the game the moment I played the bishop. In fact, I just won the piece. Check there. Uh, takes here. And, uh, of course, when he takes, I'm winning a bishop. So that more or less ended it. There were a few moves more, but they're not very interesting. The interesting part of the game is to see the strategic idea that I was able to follow. So this, what is a strategic uh, deal? Strategic deal was let's follow what, what the main plan suggests. No matter the moves, no matter the sequence, no matter the order, we know the plan, study the plan, and follow it through then you are not going to be worried about book moves. You'll be worried only as how consistent you will be towards the plan you go. Second, advance. Do you know how many people actually lose in games because they choose too many deflection moves? What I call the deflection moves is not the combinational theme deflection, no, no. Moves that distract them from whatever goal they have or they should have in the position.
Now, I like to think about moving in chess, about moves in chess, similar to the, uh, you know, like the dialogue, let's say, in, in any screenplay, for instance. What we have out there is not just a casual conversation. What we have out there is very purposeful, you know, like sentences that develop, you know, the characters and they move the plot along. So it's not just a simple conversation. It feels like it, so it's very natural. It doesn't feel forced, but they're always meaningful, or at least, you know, a good screenplay is supposed to have meaningful, meaningful conversations. That's the kind of idea that I'm going to give you. Like, if you just make moves like, oh, A3, oh, Rook H2, oh, Rook E1, it's, it's okay, but those moves don't move your play anywhere. You have to find moves that purposefully help you to move your plan along, that really solidify the position, yet help you to advance it at the same time. Now, these are the moves you want to go with. Of course, there are side moves like King B1. We always have to do these little detailed prophylactic moves which prevent any potential danger from happening when there is one. But the idea is to be as consistent as possible. And when you feel the danger, when you look and constantly ask yourself the question, what does my opponent want to do in terms of forcing or threatening moves on every move, you take the action, you know, like, like I did here, to exchange my opponent's good piece, and step by step, improve your position. The best of all things is remember, or intermediate, or even like uh, on beginner, I mean, or even intermediate level, the success is often measured not by outplaying your opponent, because, well, it's not to say that you don't have the skill, you do, but it's hard to make a perfect game that way. It's much better if you try to just improve your position, strengthen, and rely on this, I call that the gradual approach. Let your opponent come. Let him create the weaknesses. Or even if he didn't, if he doesn't like he didn't, he's just going to spend a lot of time in useless moves, which will give you enough so you can prepare yourself, break through, and open up in whatever way you want it. That's how it works. And it was a it was an interesting way to see uh, like how how that works out. And so like with the knight e3, with the f5, I was obviously much more successful. I hope you like this game. Um, and just, just to tell you, those are just a few of the little things that I was able to apply at that game in order to in order to get there, uh, to, to get to win it. It was my first official game, and I hope you liked it for like a 1700-ish level that I had. Now obviously since then I had many different games and especially once some against the masters and strong players and so but uh, it was one of the more like memorable games that I had and it was um, it was really an instructive one. Now what I'd like to show you is this next game was played between me and an international master. Yeah. Again, my game. Okay, it's my birthday, my lecture. So sorry. It's like, I wish to show. I mean, probably if I picked up a game of Bobby Fischer and Tal, it would be great. But I showed some of these in the last weeks, and it will be kind of, you know, I'm not that great <laughs> as a player, so it will feel a little strange and off the balance if I show some great master game and I compare it to my game when I was 10 years old or 12 years old. Uh, you know, that just wouldn't feel too right. So let me let me just continue with another game. That was my most memorable game because this is the one I first got to win a strong master, an international master. It was pretty impressive. Now, if anybody is actually interested in seeing these games, I'm, I'm going to have the PGNs with the annotations saved. So if anybody wants to use these games, I don't say that they're really that great, but <laughs> I mean, if you just send me a message or an email, I'd be very happy to, uh, to have a look. So you can just send me a message to valeri.liloff at gmail.com or directly through my website, basically, which is tigerliloff.com. Feel free to send me any question or your request to send those on other examples. I've got some really, I can send you pretty much any training material depending on what you like. So just let me know what you need and I'll be very glad to help or assist. In the meantime, Time, please check the link below the webinar. Just if you scroll down on the page, you're going to see 60% of a 27 hour course by Grandmaster, uh, which is amazing because it covers everything you need to become a stronger player. Check it out. It's a unique deal. It expires, I believe, tonight. So you're really going to love it. 
in any way um okay so one of you said i agree with you but it's not always guaranteed that you can unblock certain situation because like with the person with whom i played he didn't allow me to make certain open moves yeah i mean there could be a lot of different reasons but uh, you see obviously that's chess you can't have everything fixed in chess so okay Let's let's let me answer one more question. Actually, two more. Thank you. You just asked so many. Which book do you suggest for beginners for tactics and middle game? That depends on you. But I I really can't have a preference. I love Stillman's books. Mil and like uh, the um, the book of Aaron Nimzovich is great too on my system. I definitely recommend right that one. The Igor Smirnov school winning plan. Oh well, I still have some trouble. Something coming up with a good plan. Any suggestions? Yeah. Well, I mean there are a lot of courses out there. One thing though, try to work on your own understanding of the game and your own weaknesses. That's why I recommend working with a coach. When you have a coach, he can identify your weaknesses. He can suggest a specific plan. And what I often do with my students is I help them, I, t I teach them to develop the practical habits, which practically means that you don't have to even study so many books or whatever. You can have the skill so you play better. You can have the ability to recognize when a certain exchange or a certain plan is going to be good or bad. So that's definitely the one thing I help. I think helps most. Okay. Um, yeah. Now uh, let me bring up this next game. Uh, okay. So there it is. I hope you like it. Don't guarantee it. It's, it was a great game. I played it when I was only 13 years old. Yeah, I know that there are 13-year-old grandmasters out there. Like Sergey Karakin was 2,500 at the age of 12. He was a, a grandmaster in top top 200 in the world. No, I don't try to compare with any of these. <laughs> they're they're obviously super talented, and I'm just a simple, humble, mortal coach. So anyway, that was a very memorable game for me. So I really want to share it with you guys. So I was actually playing with the white pieces and. Uh, I had a rating of 2,098. Yep, not yet 2,100. I, I didn't have that rating yet. But I started with e4, and I played my favorite open game, knight of 6 knight c3, uh, g6, and then there's the Austrian attack with f4, bishop g7, knight of 3 <clears throat> c5. Now, here it is well known that white is supposed to take the pawn, and the idea is uh, to play with d to the c5, and then after d to the c5, there is bishop to d3, just so that we can defend the, uh, it can defend immediately the pawn on e4, which is great. And then after the move, uh, bishop to d3, black takes in c5 with the queen, kind of preventing the castling. This is very well known theory, so they basically white this you know disrupts the connection of black's queen by challenging it then there is castle castle king h1 which i just did so that i can open a little flight square in case the bishop is attacked and then black made the move of pawn to e5 <clears throat> so he did that move in order to get some space but i didn't know anything about what i should be doing in this position and i had to think on my own what is white supposed to do now? So I'm going to ask you guys to think about it yourself. What would you do now? Keep in mind, I wasn't a master in that game, so I didn't have the master thought <laughs> that I have right now or so. But what is this opening? It's the Pirates defense, basically. Black played the Pirates. It's a very interesting opening. Not very active, but basically it's, um, it's quite intriguing. So let's see. What do you guys think of this position? What would you do? Just share with me your thoughts and your suggestions, and I'll be glad to comment. Hmm. So we already talked a little bit about some key problems that most beginner players or intermediate even players have. But uh, how do we apply any fault process in this position? Now before this, before I tell you, I want to hear your thoughts. F5. That is an interesting move. So is this a good move? Is it a bad move? What is this? Well, basically after the move of pawn to f5, the problem is it was a quick move. It fails due to g -dix f, e -dix f and d5, which would have guaranteed black a huge center control and the possibility to do either d4 and uh, uh, let's say there is e4. So we actually realize there are plenty of challenges that black could make against the uh, against the pieces so this is not this is not too pretty 
Okay, like if we really go a little bit backward right now, we realize f5 just doesn't quite doesn't quite fit the position. But I want to tell you this: if you're playing the opening stage, be careful about any tactical sequences. Sometimes you will see a move like f5, and you can say, "Oh, Valerie, I really, 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 really love that move. I want to do it." Because if I do it, I'm going to get this, I'm going to get that, and I'm excited about it. You're excited for two moves until you actually realize that this is not right. So here's my idea. When it comes down to exciting that kind of moves, I tell you, think if you're prepared. Think if you're ready. If you're not, if you believe that this may not guarantee you the advantage or possibilities you're looking for, don't do it. So I had a different idea. Instead of jumping on with f5 that doesn't feel too safe, I had another thing. Do you know what gives you, what can bring you good success in the opening stage? What you're talking about early and late opening? What can get you to play a good, strong, and highly better position than your opponent in the middle game? You know what is the secret? Well, there's no secret, but what is the key? The key is that you have to take more space. Now, space is everything in the opening because space will guarantee you to develop your pieces on the more optimal positions to get more sp like control and restrict the opponent. It's not always easy to get it, but oftentimes the best way to get more space is to either advance your, p your pieces further or, which is even better, to move your pawns on the more advanced positions. If you can take the key squares of your pawns and your and the more advanced places for your pieces, it's going to guarantee you a very good opening. Is it a winning opening? No. Can't get a winning opening unless your opponent blunders something. But it's a very good opening, which will help you to have this modified, strong, nice-looking position with good piece and development that you care about. That's what we'd like to do. So, uh, ultimately, after the move of knight b5, queen b8, <clears throat> and then c4, uh, it was clearly very strong. Now, black plays knight g4 now. He realized that this is not going too well. He needs to get a little more space open. So, he moves the knight on the g4, and what do we do now? Why Valerie needs space on the queen side? Well, this is an important question. But the truth is, I didn't need space anywhere in particular. I just wanted to have space in general. The c4 move controls b5, b5, and I pushed my opponent back. When you have more space, you have more flexibility. When you have more flexibility, you have more possibilities. When you have more, you get the point. So I just wanted to have more space, okay? <laughs> because I know it will be helpful. Now, bishop g1, no, not really. I was going to lose the pawn that way, no. So there's a bet, another better move. Let's see if anybody could give me a good suggestion. Rook d1 is a fair move, but not really the best. Now f5. Now this is different here. I've already completed my development. Well, maybe I have to bring the rook from a1. But I wanted to play f5 because this move was going to limit black even more by restricting some of his pieces and giving me even extra space on the king side. It was an important move, and I thought this is just the right way to do it. He, he took my bishop. I took with the queen, and then after knight f6, I felt that my knight on b5 was no longer needed. It was going to be attacked, so I decided not to give him the time, so I moved it back to c3. So black played b6. And this is the moment where I had what I call a critical position. Now let's talk a little bit about critical positions in chess. What is a critical position in chess? A critical position is a position that, uh, you know, you have to take, you have to make a decision on how to continue, how to go on, and you'd like to do it carefully because that will likely determine the way your your position is going to go and the way the position is going to change most likely in the next moves. So after black just did the move of pawn to b6, I felt like the way on how I continue right here is going to determine everything. And I was right. It did. But I want to know, what would you do? Crushal? Not so much. I'd say critical position, critical for the outcome, like for the one-on-one, -on -one, how the game is going to continue. Rook c1, good move. I like that. It's a good move because it sets up the rook in a nice file, and I believe I probably considered it. I don't remember. I mean, it was like 
12 years ago, but I probably didn't do it because if I did, black would have played bishop b7, and in some way we see that black is actually going to get a fairly good game. Queen c7, queen c5, rook c8, similar good moves, which just doesn't make it right. And yet I had so much space, so much control, so much flexibility. I mean, come on, we gotta be able to use it? You know, when you, when you think about a position like that, sometimes you see the potential you've got. And you say, I have to do something with it, but I can't. And you scratch your head and you keep thinking, I gotta do something about it. But then we often forget to ask ourselves the most important question why we can't do something. I mean, whatever it is that you want to do, first of all, once you know what it is, what's holding it back? The only thing the black has that's holding white back, despite his good, terrific position, is that knight on f6. And I realized that if I'm going to do something, I have to be able to play with the move of knight d5. And then with the knight d5 on the line, there is a nice challenge in e7. There is a nice hit. And actually, that was pretty. As soon as black takes on the f5 with g dix f, I play with e dix f. And uh, I realized how good that was. In fact, black didn't have to take there. But if he did on the d5 with knight takes d, then there could have been c dix to the d5. And without that knight, we see a practical invasion on the king side, g4, g5, or g1, or f1. How many of you get to pause and think, what's the real obstacle? You see, I've noticed that when I was younger, I was rarely asking myself that question. I was able, often able to identify the problem. I was even identifying, uh, you know, what I want to do, but I wasn't thinking about the obstacle. So when I learned that, not only did it help me big time, but something actually did help me to change my thought process and develop what I've called the three-step process of handling problems in chess. Step number one, find out what you want in the given position. Now, if you say, find out, oh, I want to checkmate him, I want to win the tournament. No, find out what you want in the given position. I wanted to continue with my attack and just prove that black is behind in development and he can't stop me. Then find out, okay, so you figured out the goal, find out the problem. What is the problem? Well, we don't have any aggressive ways to do it. The problem is that I didn't have G4, I didn't have knight D5, I didn't have any real threats. And then look at, find out what's the obstacle. What's the, what's the actual creator of that problem? What's making the problem to you? The problem was obviously the knight on F6. If the knight wasn't there, I had all my tactics. And I really knew that by exchanging this knight with a simple and yet very powerful knight d5, everything was going to work out. It was a strong strategic move that held me out. So the three-step process of resolving problems, your goal, your current goal, then it is finding out the problem in the position and then find out the actual you know, like reason for that problem, the real obstacle. And once you resolve it, that's it. So black played g dix f. He actually wanted to complicate the game a little bit, but that was only bad for him because the reality is that he was undeveloped. And by making more of these opening moves that open up the position, he was actually getting himself in more trouble. So what would you like to do with white? Obviously, black's intending to challenge the knight, maybe play rook j8, uh, king h8, rook g8 to open up some challenge on the g file. I think he had some good dynamic ideas of the position. So what do you think? What do we do now? You have any suggestion, guys? What should I do? Now keep in mind that the strategic principles we're talking about today are common, and they happen in almost any games played by a master. However, knowing a little more about how to overcome these, pro these problems or these typical situations and how to handle them, how to tackle them is essential. For this reason, 
I, I recommend you to check the link below this lecture. It offers 60% off a 27-hour course covering all the key topics to make you a better player. These and other principles, I'm really impressed by the quality, so check it out. I think you would really like to have that one if you're serious about your chess, and it's at a practically extremely cheap price, uh, and so you can get it and then start your start your improvement was queen g5 or knight g5 here the better see i knew something the attack the possibilities depend on two things my attack and my speed so i, I needed to obviously look for a speedy moves and the other important thing was to make sure i get enough far power to attack so speed and pieces first move we exchange and then as soon as I actually had the exchange coming instead of Queen g5 which would have helped his knight to stay by trading on b5 I wanted to exchange his knight and then move my own knight on g5 while well, Queen h6 because he would have jumped back and then push f6 I didn't want to launch to engage anything too tactical unless I actually gather around and regroup my pieces in the way they're supposed to be with knight g5, obviously there is an opening to knight e4. There's also queen h6 and similar moves coming along the way. And it feels a lot more natural to get those pieces and start advancing. After knight g5, black did queen to the d8. And then I play knight e4. He does rook c8. And then I did rook f3. And you suddenly realize that not only the black doesn't have the time to play king h8 and rook g8, but pretty much every single one of my pieces is quickly coming down and moving along to reach and threaten black's king side. I moved my rook on h3. He played this. And I got rook g1. And now I'm going to talk about one of the key things. So we talked about, you know, the forcing moves, how important it is to play more forcingly and, you know, look for attacking moves like forcing checks, captures, direct threats. We talk about like strategic skills that separate, you know, like great players from bad. And like we talked about, you know, like how masters sort of balance the positional consideration, like just the what, what, you know, like what you have to know about balancing, like when you go a little more quietly, when you go a little, a uh, little like differently. But one of the things that I didn't mention is how do you get to attack and play aggressively without leaving yourself in a vulnerable position? Now, this is essential. If you want to make sure that you lead up, a risk-free type of attack against your opponent. Your major hope shouldn't go towards finding the proper calculation or the big breakthrough, but it must lie within your ability to set a huge amount of pieces right there directly against your opponent. Because once you do that, once you set the pieces, it's going to help you big time. Once the black rook came on the g7, there was b3. And I felt like because black didn't have the ability to do anything, I have all the time in the world to regroup and make my attack work. A couple of little exchanges naturally followed, but it didn't matter because I knew black was never going to create any serious threats. I even chose to uh, like repeat the position a couple of moves, like so rook c3, knight e4. And he actually did the move of queen a8 in this position. He didn't want to retreat, obviously, for natural reasons. He played queen a8. And I remember he was very confident. I mean, my, my master was like, okay, he's, uh, all right, if, it, if I take on f6, there will be bishop takes g2. He stepped up. He started walking around, being very confident and happy about his position. And I kind of felt it like, really? I mean, he's just all over the place. All of his pieces are moved around there's no connection no real coordination and suddenly he wants to attack me how is that possible it's not it's not supposed to be so then I started thinking what should I do am I supposed to just stay back and survive with rookie one to defend my knight in case he takes on d3 to protect it or maybe there is something better and I remember that the secret of being better at attacking is to consider forcing moves. As the major candidate 
forcing moves are or should be on the top of your priority list because oftentimes they don't work but when they do they could be crucial so you must start with any checks captures or direct threats just to consider them if they don't work fine you wouldn't spend more than 30 seconds to think about them yet when there is a move like rook takes h7 you don't want to miss it if king takes h7 comes i was going to take on f6 and go for a checkmate rook h7 queen takes and when the black rook moves away the fact is that there is no attack on g2 so i was just able to take on c3 and prove him wrong <laughs> in fact i did it's like that's why i call potential the build up he didn't have any potential any build up i felt he was wrong and so if i can give you the biggest advice today i'm going to tell you don't rely on calculations well there are certain things that you obviously have to calculate and i, I don't exclude the calculation of of your uh, you know of your strategies i think however that you have to give a lot more attention at the ideas of the position, at the preparation, at the setup, at the skeleton. If you think about that, the calculations are easier to make because you know where to look for, you know what to calculate. Otherwise, it's like you'll be on a road trip without a map, without knowing where you're going or what you're looking for, and it just doesn't work. It's extremely time consuming and wrong. I knew my opponent was wrong because I had a better potential. It was just a matter of time or a few moves for me to find how do I break him through. Okay, he kept on going. I mean, he played a rook h4, which is fine. But in the end of the day, after I exchanged a strong bishop and he took back, of course, the idea was for me to play rook e1 and deal with the queen by playing bishop to the g4. I don't know if you've heard about that, but in opposite colored bishops, when you're attacking, are incredibly strong. So after I played queen g3 and he moved back, I just did, uh, you know, queen c3. And on the next move, uh, my idea was to just challenge his rook away so that I can take out any counter play he could ever create. So as he went back, I moved my queen, preparing preparing for rook to d1. And we played for another 30 moves or so, but it was a very painful and completely useless uh, game for him. It was a pawn down. His king was exposed. He could never get his pieces in place, and it was very easy for me to win. The interesting part of this game, however, was how I was able to acquire my advantage by first gaining a lot of space, which is uh, what a lot of chess players don't like understand too well or actually underestimate in the opening so fight for the space and then the other thing tackle the problem in the three step method i gave you you can learn many of these methods and all and, and else if you check this link like the 27 hours uh, at 60 percent off just today check it out it's below the video i'm going to send one a link on the chat but there are many methods like that which will help you to really learn and get better at playing so don't forget to check it out however the most important thing was actually this type of thing where i discovered that the biggest problem was going to be that black knight and that if, if i wanted to be successful i definitely had to move against it and uh, yeah that was basically it knight d5 then uh, pawn takes then the other knight came and little by little, I was able to get the potential. When my opponent attacked and he felt he was successful, I knew he was wrong because he didn't have that preparation. He didn't have that build up. And all I had to find was to look for a forcing move. And of course, Rook takes H7 came up. So one question uh, was like, how do we play for a win when we have an imbalanced position? When we have a balanced position? Well, we have to create an imbalance. Maybe you can do it by strengthening your pieces or maybe by creating a weakness or provoke your opponent to weaken. Yes, creating imbalances is essential. But in any case, I hope that you like these games that I was able to show you today, and I hope you was able to learn a good time from them. So yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Once again, don't forget to check the link with the 27 hour scores for 60% off. It's an amazing deal, and I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it can help you a lot. So check it out, and if you want me to send you any of those games or any other training materials or suggestions, or if you have any questions, feel free to message me through my email, which is valeri.lilov at gmail.com. I'd be very happy to bring you my uh, feedback and suggestions, or you can check my site tigerlewolf.com message me or chat me anytime whenever you want i'll be more than happy to provide you with an advice suggestion or send you any training material you may need so thank you again 
and I'll speak to you the coming Saturday next week at the same time. So feel free to join. The topic is going to be on move candidates, one of the most important topics uh, on for any improving player. So uh, tune in, and I'll see you next time.